Hey everyone, Nathan here, Absurd Being. So today we are looking at the preface to totality and infinity. Um, I don't know if you're catch. this is the last video I'm making, so I don't know if you've already read the whole book or you've gone through the whole series and, and I'm kind of throwing this in at the very end, or if you spotted it early and, and, and watched it, are watching it at the beginning as you're actually beginning the book. Um, but uh, either way, <laughs> this is the video. Uh, so when I read through the preface, it seemed that there were two ways, two main um, ways I could break this up. Um, and so that's what I've done, broken it up into two parts. The first part is war and morality. In this, at, or at the beginning of, of the preface, Levinas notes the permanent possibility of war. War is always possible for us. And war suspends morality. In war, um, questions of right and wrong, questions of, of thinking about the other, other people, they all get kind of pushed to the side. Because in morality, the, uh, sorry, in war, the goal is to win. And this, uh, is closely tied in with the political for Levinas. So, war is a permanent possibility. War suspends morality. Therefore, Levinas asks, is morality even possible? Is it even possible to talk about morality in, in any meaningful sense if it can just be abolished any time, whenever war breaks out? Um, and, and since war is a permanent possibility, then morality is, is kind of always um, the it's, it's always possible for morality to be abolished for us just to revert back to this amoral existence. So the question I think behind the whole preface is: Is morality possible? Um, so then we look at in war a, a little bit more detail um, and Levinas notes that the violence of war is less about injury and death and more about interrupting people's continuity, making them play roles in which they no longer recognize themselves, making them betray not only commitments but their own substance making them carry out actions that will destroy every possibility for action. War destroys the identity of the same. So the idea here is that um, the main threat of war is, yes, injury and death, but it has this bigger impact, has this, this deeper impact on us because it destroys who we are. It destroys us as individuals, um, forcing us to, to do things that we wouldn't normally do, that we don't want to do, that don't align with perhaps how we see ourselves. Um, so we, And that, that's what Levinas means when he says war destroys the identity of the same. We are that identity of the same. That, it, that's a reference to the I to to the um, to the individual him or herself so it destroys the same because it destroys the identity of the same because we lose our individuality and we we particularly lose it in this greater good in this hoped for future Levinas says and that means that we are we we are becoming subsumed into this totality which is bigger than us, which reduces us to being a mere part of. So we become just parts of this this greater um, struggle for freedom, this, this greater good, this hoped for future. And that's the real problem for Levinas. So the image of being in war is totality. Being is a totality in war, being is understood as this this greater good, this this um, whole capital W whole in which I am a part, and that's 
the destruction of the identity of the same. I lose my own identity in this in this bigger picture. So even peace then doesn't resolve this, doesn't overcome this, because there is only peace um, on a foundation of war. Peace only makes sense in response to war. Uh, and so the it's like the, the foundations haven't changed. Even if we achieve peace, the foundations are the same. The foundations are this... Um, the, uh, the being as totality. We're still caught up in this, in this um, destruction of the identity of the same. Because that, that's kind of the, the foundation on which the peace is built. It's built on the, the same foundations as war. It's, it's kind of operating at the same level in a way. It, it's, um, we haven't reoriented ourselves in achieving peace we haven't done anything we haven't changed our fundamental picture of being we haven't changed our fundamental um, image of being we're still operating with the same image of being which is a totality so what's needed Levinas says is a primordial and original relation with being we need to completely reorient ourselves towards being in order to um, <clears throat> in order to, to come to something, to some understanding, which doesn't destroy this identity of the same, which doesn't rob us of our individuality. And that more primordial, more original relation with being is eschatology. So philosophy relies on reason, evidence, and experience. And this all, for Levinas, indicates totality. This all suggests a totality. Reason, evidence, and experience make sense within a totality, a unified um, whole. And that means that philosophy, as we, we talked about before, with peace, rests on a foundation of war. We haven't changed the fundamental, um, we haven't changed our, our orientation towards being. We're still seeing being in terms of a totality, the, the whole. And that, that approach, the, the approach of philosophy, the approach of, of totality, yields a morality that is founded on politics, which Levinas calls the art of foreseeing war and of winning it. So it's founded, morality is founded on politics, which means it's founded on a, on, on a totality of equal multiplicities. It's founded on a totality of equal individuals, a, a, total, a, a plurality of um, individuals, but individuals that then only make sense in the greater whole, in this totality that have therefore lost that identity of the same. They've lost that, that individuality. So, eschatology institutes a relation with being beyond the totality or beyond history. It is a relationship with a surplus always exterior to the totality, as though the concept of infinity were needed to express this transcendence with regard to totality. So, a couple of things to note regarding that. that this, this is what eschatology is for Levinas. It's a relationship with a surplus that is always exterior. And this surplus, which is always exterior, is precisely infinity. And so, that, so, so that's going to be an important concept in totality. and infinity. It's in the name, right? It's going to be an important idea in, in the book. Um, but that's what that's what infinity is. This notion that we can have a relationship with something that is always it's a surplus, always exterior to the totality. It's always beyond the totality. It's always beyond even what I can what I can grasp as a part of this totality. 
It's beyond reason, evidence, and experience. Um, and so that's what that's what infinity is. And eschatology then is the breach of this breach of the totality. It's, it's going beyond the totality to this exterior, to this surplus that is beyond the totality. This doesn't mean that we can access the infinity, the, the surplus beyond um, the surplus that's always exterior to the totality. If we could access it, if we could, if we could grasp it, then it would no longer be um, a surplus always exterior to the totality. It would become a part of the totality. So it's always going to be beyond our grasp in some way. And yet we're, we're able to have a relationship with it. And this is precisely what ethics is for Levinas. So eschatology, this, um, this breach of the totality, this movement towards something which is infinite, which is always beyond our grasp, that is exactly what ethics is. So eschatology, ethics, cannot be founded in experience because infinity overflows the thought that thinks it. We can't ground our ethics or our, our eschatology, that's Levinas's word, we can't ground it in experience. We can't ground it in philosophy even, be, at least not as traditionally done, because experience takes place in a totality. Experience requires things that make sense for me, that, which means things that I have brought into my ambit of concern, things that are within my sphere, which means they're no longer completely exterior. They're no longer surplus to the totality. Um, however, so that... that with that being said, eschatology can't be founded in experience. Levinas also notes that since experience is a relation with the absolutely other, the relation accomplishes experience in the fullest sense of the word. So this is like um, kind of a knowing without concepts without intellectual concepts to back it up without without relying on reason and logic which only makes sense within a, a totality so this is not a an appeal to mysticism or um, some kind of sixth sense and intuition or anything like that it's not an appeal to to knowing through meditation or, or anything anything mystical in any supernatural all he means is that um, and, and it's tough to explain it now it will be, get fleshed out in the book but experience is a relation experience is a relation with the absolute other and that means that Levinas is basically changing the definition of experience a little bit. Experience typically means something we can grasp, we can apprehend with concepts, we can, we can um, get our heads around. But if we can do that, then we're, we've reduced whatever it is we're talking about to a totality with me, to just another part of my world. And what Levinas', is, Levinas is point here is that um, the relation that he's looking for is is one that is is exterior to any totality that can't be brought into a relation, a direct relation with me, because if it could do that, it becomes part of my world. It becomes part of the totality. So, um, since experience for Levinas is this this fundamental relation with something which is fundamentally ungraspable, unknowable in the traditional sense, then re that relation accomplishes experience in the fullest sense of the word. So it's, it's like we, um, it's a deeper sense of experience, I think is what Levinas is getting at here.
we 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 can't know um, being through the the normal way we think about experience, but but the being that Levinas is proposing is actually a deeper sense of experience, and uh, and that a key part of that that is going to be infinity. So it's worth having a little look at the idea of infinity now. Um, so when Levinas talks about infinity, we're not talking about the idea, and particularly the idea of infinity. We're not talking about apprehending infinity as if it was something that existed and then we could approach it and, and grasp it and um, collapse it into some kind of definition or you know if, so if it was something we could get our heads around it wouldn't it would no longer be the infinite the the idea we have would no longer capture infinity because infinity is is by definition what's beyond our ability to form a concept of to form an idea of so rather Infinity is produced in the relationship of the same with the other. The idea of infinity is the mode of being, the infinition of infinity. Infinity does not first exist and then reveal itself. Its infinition is produced as revelation, as a positing of its idea in me. Okay, so the infinite... The infinite is produced in the relationship of the same with the other. So in a way, we're saying here, or Levinas is saying here, that the inf infinite, the in that infinity is lived, not known. Um, it's produced in the relation. It's produced in the, the revelation of the other to us, this fundamental exteriority. This, this being that cannot be brought into a relation with a, a relation directly with me because it's always beyond anything that I can, any concepts I can form, any definitions I might try to make to enclose the other within. So the infinite is, um, it's produced in the relationship, which is, which is to say it's not grasped as an intellectual concept rather it's lived in that in that relationship in that concrete relationship and the idea of infinity is the mode of being of infinity so the idea is again bound up with this revelation bound up with the relation it's lived it's not something it's not what it's definitely not is a representation of infinity it's not a concept it's uh, the idea, what what Levinas is calling the idea here, is not a real idea in the sense that we usually use that word. Because an idea is, when we when we typically say idea, we mean a concept, um, something, an intellectual um, grasping of something, a reduction of something to to an image or or a thought in my head, but. That's not going to work with infinity because infinity necessarily, by what by what it is, as infinite, it always extends. It, it's always beyond any idea I might form of it. So the idea of infinity, only we only have the idea of infinity through the mode of being of infinity, which is that relation, that relation with the... Um, the surplus that's always exterior to the totality. A lot of this won't make much sense if you haven't read the book already. I mean, and if you're just starting, um, just just kind of let the word let let it, let the ideas wash over you. And once you get into the book, things will will quickly make much more sense. But um, but yeah. That, that's the idea, and, and the infinite is going to be important for Levinas, um, and this notion that the infinite is 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 always beyond whatever we can, whatever concepts or ideas we might we might try and form of it. 
So Levinas is very much going beyond phenomenology. Intentionality here is not going to work for Levinas because intentionality, obviously, if we can intend something, then it is within our sphere of, it's within my world. I've reduced whatever it is that I'm intending to, in essence, a part of me, a part of my world. It becomes a part of the totality. I become subsumed into this totality with the thing that I intend, um, which is not, again, Levinas is going beyond totalities. So phenomenology is not going to work. In, pheno in phenomenology, with, which is um, centered around intentionality, the thought always remains an adequation with the object. So being and representation are seen as equal. Being and appearance are seen as equal. But this won't work exactly um, for exactly the reason I said before. We're looking to get beyond. We're looking for a relation with something that escapes any thought. A being that has no um, correlation to any, any thought or concept I might form of it. And he's also going beyond Heidegger's disclosure here. So disclosure was an important part of Heidegger's philosophy of being. But the other, for Levinas, the, um, the, the other as, as the infinite cannot be understood as a disclosure because as infinite, it never discloses itself to us. It, again, it's always a surplus. So he's going, he's kind of positioning himself in opposition to Husserl and Heidegger there um, in, in this, with this, this philosophy, his philosophy of eschatology going beyond the totality, beyond um, what we normally think of as being. So truth then for Levinas is aspiration to radical exteriority. And this is what he defines as metaphysics, this movement beyond the totality, beyond my world, beyond, beyond what um, kind of makes sense to me, what refers to me, going beyond this to a radical exteriority. That's metaphysics for Levinas. And that is precisely what ethics is. And so the rest of the book is just going to flesh that out. That, that, but that's the core idea, going beyond a totality to this um, surplus that is always exterior. All right, summary. So the question, the main question, I think, in the preface, is morality possible? And we started looking at war, which we saw was always a possibility. And war eliminates the individual in favor of the totality. So war is always, uh, war is political for Levinas. It's, it's about achieving a goal and achieving a goal for an individual in which that it, the individual plays a part in a greater whole, a greater totality. So the individual is really lost there. Um, and that means that the individual is not there to have a relation with a, a surplus beyond the totality. And that's why, that's why the individual is important, by the way. Um, but that's why we need it. So uh, war, in the, in, in the sense that it eliminates the individual, also eliminates the possibility for ethics for Levinas. So then we looked at eschatology, and this is a relation with being beyond the totality. It's basically um, another word for ethics. It's basically what ethics is for Levinas, a movement beyond the totality, a movement beyond to the infinite, the, the permanently exterior. And that was a key concept here, the infinite. Um, and a main, one of the main ideas with the infinite, in particular the idea of infinity, is it is produced in the relationship with the other, with 
the um, the infinite that is always beyond the totality. So the infinite is something which which doesn't appear. It can't. It can't appear as a concept or as an idea for us, except by being experienced in this relation, in this relation that goes beyond the totality. So now we can finally answer the question that we posed at the beginning. The question, is morality possible? The answer, morality is possible as eschatology. So eschatology, again, they're going beyond, going beyond the totality. That's the only way that morality is possible for Levinas. Anything else keeps you stuck in that totality, keeps you stuck in, in a, um, a situation in which morality is, is, um, is always threatened. It's, it's never something that's certain because it can be lost through war, which is always a possibility. So morality, true morality, morality that actually means something for Levinas is only possible as eschatology. And that's the preface. Um, so that, that if you've if you've if you're just starting the book, you've got a lot to go. So I won't um, I won't hold you up. If you if you're watching these videos in the order that I made them, you've probably finished the book. Um, in which case, congratulations. And um, yeah, that's it for me. Thanks for watching and um, have a great day. I'll see you in the next video.